All right, so we finished the midterm, and so far what we've done is to write down rules for how to differentiate just about any kind of function that you're going to see in this class. All right, so of course we had our, our power rules and our sum rules and our product rules and our quotient rules and our chain rules, and we learned how to differentiate trig functions, hypertrig functions, exponential functions, and log functions, and the inverses of all the above functions. Okay, so it was a lot of fun. We did some proofs. Some of you liked it. Some of you didn't, but that's okay, right? Now we know how to do it. Okay, now what was the point of doing all that? Well, the point was so that we could use calculus to solve real-world problems. So, what I'm going to do today is not solve a lot of real-world problems, but I'm going to at least outline how we're going to solve real-world problems. I'm going to tell you everything we're going to do for the rest of the term, roughly speaking. So, it's going to be very similar to what we did in the first lecture, and so I will call it the big picture. That way it's like a movie sequel. All right, so let's quickly pan our camera over to this sideboard, which we don't ever go on to, but now everybody knows there's an extra board in this room. I just want to quickly outline what kind of stuff we're going to do. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is rewrite down the chain rule to solve problems. And these problems are going to be called related rate problems. And then I'll go through and talk about each one of these. Then we're going to talk about linear approximation. Which is really going to be nothing new. Right? It's just going to be a way of taking a function. All right, you're going to write down the derivative, right, which is going to be the tangent line at a point. All right, and that's going to be your linear approximation of the curve. We're going to talk about Taylor and Maclaurin series, which are really almost the same thing, just Maclaurin series is a special case. And if we feel motivated to do so, we'll talk about differentials, uh, although I may not say much about them today. Okay, so these are just a, a well, not this one, but the other things are just really a few quick applications of things we've already done, right, which, which require very little thought at all. Okay, this one requires a lot more thought. We're not going to prove anything. We're just going to write it down. But we're going to come back to it in 166, right, when we have integration theory, which is going to help us uh, flush out this theory a little bit. Okay, so then we're going to get into curve sketching. Okay, that is, if you have a function and you want to draw the graph, and you don't have, say, Mathematica or Maple around, you just want to figure out what is this graph going to look like, okay, maybe not precisely at every point, but can give you a good idea, how can we use calculus to draw graphs? So, involved in that is going to be a lot of stuff. So, let's see, are we going to be able to get this side too? We will if we... We turn it. Okay, now you need to turn your around. Don't worry, I'm fast around it. Okay, we'll zoom. Very good. If I watch the movie, it'll be over. What movies have come? Nobody knows these movies. Have okay, so as part of curve sketching, first thing we're going to talk about are. <laughs> Call them extremal values. Okay, these are going to be something called max and min values. We're going to talk about local max and min and absolute max and min. Okay. We're going to talk about critical numbers. Okay, these critical numbers are going to be very special places on the curve. 
right? Namely, either when the derivative is going to be zero or where the derivative doesn't exist. Okay. And we're going to use these critical numbers uh, to you know, talk about things like, well, first we'll have something which I'll just call ID test. This is going to stand for increasing decreasing test. And then once we use these critical numbers, we'll get what I'm going to call F prime test. And this is usually known as the first derivative test. We're going to talk about concavity. What does it mean for a, a graph to be concave up or concave down? Okay, and corresponding to this, we're going to get the concavity test. And then quickly thereafter, we'll get what I call the F double prime test or the second derivative test. And then we're going to put all these things together in graph curves. Okay. And it's really going to be pretty intuitive how it, it all works together, right? As long as you remember what the derivative is, right? The slope. I mean, the derivative is telling you the slope of a tangent line to a curve. Okay. And then once we get all these things, we're going to be able to work on a very nice problem called optimization problems. Right. Optimizing, say, your profits or the area of some open space, right, where you're trying to keep your cattle, uh, you know, because you want them to be free range. Okay, very nice. So, okay, so this is what we're heading that time with that. That's what, but that over there was what we were heading towards. Okay. Uh, if we have time at the end of the term, of course, we're going to hit this anti-differentiation stuff. But I really want to leave that out of the discussion today. So that's what we're, we're gearing towards. So let's start by quickly discussing related rates. Okay. Remember, we have the chain rule. Okay. And the way, of course, we've been writing the chain rule right, is if you have let me write it with our composed symbol. If you have two functions and they're composed, f composed g, so like x plus 3 squared, right? That was a composition of functions, x plus 3 and x squared. And you take the derivative, then this was the same as first taking the derivative, right, of what we call the outside function, and then evaluating it at the original function, right? Or you could write this as composed g. And then multiplying by the derivative of the inside function, which we call g prime. Okay, so this was the chain rule. But we saw another way to write down the chain rule earlier, right? And it's going to be the same rule, it's just a different way to write it. So let's say that, uh, let's use v is, let's just write it like this. v is a function of u. And u is a function of x. So we have a function of a function. Okay, v is a function of u, u is a function of x. And if you want to know the derivative of the function v with respect to x, then the chain rule says that the derivative of this is going to be the product of the derivatives. It's going to be the derivative of v with respect to u. Right? So you evaluate the derivative of v and evaluate it at u, that's the same thing as we did up here, times the derivative of u with respect to x, right? That's the, the g prime up here. Okay. So this is a generalized example of what we mean by related rates. Okay? The derivative is telling you the rate of change of something. Okay? So we also, okay, derivative of the slope of the tangent line. Okay, but the slope is how much, how quickly the line is changing, right? It's the rate of change of the line with respect to well, how far it's going. Okay, so this is saying the rate of change of v with respect to u times the rate of change of u with respect to x equals the rate of change of v with respect to x. Okay, so I think, let's just think of a little example. Let's say uh, I had a balloon. Okay, I can't really draw a balloon. Looks very much like a, like a 
delightful. But okay, so my kids have balloons. They love little balloons, right? And they always come up to me. And, They're making me blow it up right till I pass out. But right, as long as I, you know, uh, you know, don't pass out, okay, everything is fine. But let's say I do pass out. Then what do I have to do with my kids? Right? They still want the balloon pumped up. So let's say I'm gonna pump, hook it up to some sort of machine. Right? It's gonna blow up lots of balloons for them. Okay? And usually these machines will have a little gauge on it. It'll tell you how much air it's putting in. Right? It'll tell you the volume of the air that it's putting in. And it's usually constant. Okay, but it doesn't have to be. Okay, but in any case, right, if you look at this gauge, you can see how fast the balloon is filling up with air, right? And that is, what's the rate of change of the volume of the balloon with respect to time? Okay. But let's say I wanted to know how fast the radius of the balloon was changing as I was pumping it up. Now, is there a device that measures that? Stephanie says, yes. What is it? So, okay, so if you computed the circumference, right? But imagine, or okay, you have to, you tie a string around it. At any given point, you can know what the, the we circumference use is. That equation. Okay, we're gonna have to use this equation, right? Of course, that's where, of course, we're leading to, right? So, what we do know, though, is that the rate of change of the volume is related to the rate of change of the radius, right? As the volume is growing, so is the radius. We also know that if you forget about rate of change, the volume is related to the radius, right? There's a formula for it, right? Volume equals, assume this was a sphere, okay? That's kind of the easy way to do this. The volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Okay, so there's some relation between these things. Okay, so what we're going to do is show how to compute, well, say this v is volume and u is, is the radius, okay? We can use this equation Right? If we know what the rate of change is vol the volume is because, well, we have a, a little meter that tells us, okay? and we know, say, at what time we're talking about, then we can use this equation to compute the rate of change of the radius. Okay? So that's where we're going to go with related rates. Okay? And we're going to do a lot of really interesting examples. You know, the most common one that you see in textbooks is, okay, you have a ladder, right? and it's tilted right, up against the wall, okay? and it starts falling down. All right? And there's two rate of changes that you can think about, right? Which is, okay, how far is the ladder falling this way and how far is this thing shooting out? Okay, and you want to know how, how they're related. Okay, fine. You're going to use related rates. Okay. Then we're going to talk about linear proximity. Okay. This is going to be We've really done this already. We just didn't phrase it in this way. Okay, let's say we have a nice curve. I pick a point on this curve and I draw the tangent line. So if this curve is called f of x, what is the slope of this line here? Let's say this point is a. What's the slope of that line? F prime of a, right? The slope of this line is f prime of a because that's the derivative, right? The derivative tells you the slope of the tangent line. Okay. So at this point over here, right, f of a, well, you can write down the equation of this tangent line. Right? So we use point slope form and we say, okay, fine, y minus f of a equals the slope, which is f prime of a, times x minus a. Right? Or if we solve for y, then we get y equals f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. Right. Okay. We did it. We had a problem on the midterm on this sort of this sort of problem. Okay. Fine, we, there's nothing new here, right? Okay. Well we call this so this line. is called the linear approximation of f f a. Okay. So what do I mean by linear approximation? Well, I mean, if you take this curve, right, and you were to say, well, 
you know, what's it going to look like? What, or what would be an approximation of this curve by a line? It's exactly this tangent line. Okay? Which means, well, you know, one nice thing about lines is they're very easy to use. Okay? If you want to know what's going to happen in the future to some function, if it's a line, it's very easy to figure it out, right? You just figure out what the slope is. If you want to go one unit into the future, you just go up by the slope or down by the slope, whatever if it's positive or negative. So lines are much easier to use. Now, as you go farther and farther away from this point, how good of an approximation is this line to the curve? It's not very good. But if you're very close to it, how far off is it? Oh, it's not that bad, right? Not only that, but you can tell whether or not your approximation is too high or too little. Right? As I go away, what's happening? The line is above the curve. So I know that my approximation, whatever I choose, right, at any point my approximation is going to be a little bit too high. Same thing on the other side. Right? It always needs to be a little bit too high. Okay? So but we're, we're going to be able to use this, for instance, to give a, a very good approximation of things like the square root of 3.98, right, or the square root of 4.03, right? Okay, normally if somebody said figure out what this is, well you say, okay, well I know it's a round two. Okay. But because they're near four, right? Square root of four is two. But we're gonna be able to do better. We're gonna be able to say, what do we mean by a round? Okay. And this is gonna tie in to the next topic, which is going to be Taylor series. Okay. So if I can approximate my curve by a line, and I get a reasonably good approximation, then what if I approximate it by something maybe a little more complicated than a line? Right? So for instance, what, what, what do you think is somehow the next most complicated curve after a line? A, a parabola, right? Why a parabola? Because it's x squared, right? A line is a degree one polynomial, right? There's just a power of x and it's just x to the first, right? If you went to x squared, you'd have a parabola. Okay, so we somehow think that's the next, the next most difficult. So I'm actually not going to tell you what a general Taylor series is or even close to what it is. I'm only going to talk about Maclaurin series right now. But this is not so bad. Uh, to tell you what I, I mean, okay, here I did the linear approximation of a function at A. And that's what the general Taylor series is going to do. It's going to do an approximation right, of your f at A. But a Maclaurin series is always going to assume A is 0. Okay, So the Maclaurin series for this function would be Right, you would always look at the tangent line at zero. Okay, so of course, you can see this has only limited value because right, once you get away from zero, it's not a very good approximation. Okay, but the formula is much easier to write down right, because now it's just minus a goes away, and this is f prime of zero, and that's f of zero. Everything's much easier. So for today, okay, I just write it down. I actually just do more. So, what we're going to say is that I can approximate my function f of x by writing down first, well, okay, and I'm going to approximate it around 0. Okay, so I first get f of 0, right? And it's going to look just like the formula we had for linear approximation. So the next bit is going to be f prime of 0 times x. Notice I don't have to put x minus a because I have, uh, my a is 0. So I have f prime of 0 times x. Okay. So this would just be the linear approximation. Okay, fine, no problem. If we wanted to evaluate, if we wanted to approximate it, however, by a second degree polynomial, all we have to do is add on a 
squared term with a coefficient, I'm going to write f prime prime of 0 over 2. And what do I mean f prime prime? I mean take the derivative and then take the derivative again. It's called the second derivative. Right? You just take the derivative and then the derivative again. Okay? Divide it by 2 and then multiply it by x squared. Now, let's say I wanted to actually do an even better approximation. Okay, so I would approximate by the next best thing, which would be a cubic. Okay, and the way to do that, well, I do f prime prime prime, the third derivative. So I take a derivative, take another derivative, take another derivative, evaluate it at zero. And now, what do you think I divide by? By what? Three. By three, right? Turns out that's wrong. I'll show you why that's wrong. Okay. Of course, I could write this. Okay, I haven't changed it. I just divided by 1. But what I could actually write, instead of 1, I could write 0 factorial. Okay? And remember, well, 0 factorial is actually just defined as 1. That's just a, a, a name. And then I have 1 factorial, right, which is just defined again as 1. And then I have 2 factorial. 2 factorial is 2 times 1. So the next one is not going to be a 3, but a 3 factorial, which means 3 times 2 times 1. And so I have x cubed here. Okay, and then if I wanted to, to approximate it even better, I put down, okay, so now I don't write 4 primes. I put iv, the Roman numeral for 4. Okay. Evaluated at 0, right? or I write iv, or you could write 4. Okay, but usually you put some parentheses around it. I'm going to divide it by 4 factorial, right? 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 24. And I put x to the 4. Okay? And of course, there's nothing to stop me from keep, to keep going forever and ever. Okay, and the way we write this, when we add up the whole series, right, where we, go, we let the exponent go to infinity, right, as much as we want. And we've used this Greek letter sigma, which means sum. Right? And we're going to write i equals 0 to infinity. So we're going to let all possible positive powers. And we get the i-th derivative evaluated at 0 divided by i factorial times x to the i. Okay, that's the shorthand for this entire series. Okay, now I'm sweeping a lot of technicalities under the rug, of course. Okay, but it's actually turned out that this approximately equal to right, actually can turn into an equal to. Okay? And so we're going to be able to write down formulas for some of our favorite functions, like e to the x and sine of x and cosine of x. And we're going to see that they're very much related. It's going to be a lot of fun. Good stuff coming. OK, so I don't want to talk about differentials right now. It takes a while, and I think it just confuse you. It's kind of hard to see the applications immediately, and, and it's really just a corollary of what's going on with linear approximation, I think. Okay, but so this is going to kind of wrap up just the basic stuff that is coming from linear approximation. And we won't need to do anything, we won't need to think in any new ways. Okay, so next section will be on curve sketching. So let's quickly draw a curve. Okay, and let's say then it's going to turn around. And this one is going to also turn around. OK, so this should be some nice smooth portion here. OK, so. Intuitively, what's the what's the, the big point on this curve? Tell me when I get to the biggest point. Yeah. Right there, okay? Right. <laughs> Clearly this curve doesn't get any higher. So we call that the absolute maximum. Where's the lowest point on this curve? 
be said anything. Where's the lowest point on this curve? What's that? The boundaries. Which boundaries? Oh, I'm just letting this go on, on and on. No. Negative infinity. Somebody said, "Well, negative infinity is not a number." Here. That's the absolute smallest thing that this function does? Yeah. yeah, what about there? That's smaller. Okay, so there is no absolute minimum to this function, right? As much as you, if you say there's a minimum and it's here, right, it always keeps going down. Okay, so there's no absolute minimum. Okay, but what, what Jewin said is, but look over here, right? There is this point which somehow looks minimal, right? And so what do we mean when we call it a minimum, right? Well, if you look near it, if you just turn, tune out the rest of the function, okay, and you just look in a little area around it, okay, this is certainly smaller than anything near it, okay? Just a little, we call it a neighborhood. Okay, if you look in a neighborhood at that point, okay, you just look around here, it's certainly smaller than everything around it. Right? And if I get into smaller and smaller neighborhoods, it's always the smallest point in those neighborhoods. Right? So we call this a local minimum. Right? So local meaning just right near it. Okay? You may be the smartest person in your high school, right? but when you go to college, all of a sudden you're no longer the smartest person. right? And just because you're the smartest person in your high school doesn't mean you're the smartest person in the world. But you still might be the smartest person in your high school. Okay. Is there another local minimum? About right there. Okay, again, if you just look at near points near it, it's the smallest point. Okay, so we get another one right there. Of course, if you can have a local minimum, you should have a local maximum. And of course, right? Those are three candidates. Okay, so local max. Okay, so you have one there, you have one there, right? And of course, these are maxes because in the neighborhood, these are the highest points. What about this? Is that a local max? And we already said it's an absolute max. So can an absolute maximum be a local maximum? Of course, right? Because near it, it's the highest point. All right. Now, why would we care about local maxes and local mins? Yeah, when this happens, right, what happens to the, the curve? It and then it comes up again. Okay, it's kind of turning around. Okay, now let's just look at these pictures. What if I draw the tangent lines at these points? These are all flat. So. What would you say would be a good way to find local mins and local maxes? The derivative equals zero. Yeah, look for where the derivative equals zero. Okay. So if f prime at some point is zero, what can we say? You have a horizontal tangent. Then there is a horizontal tangent. Now, does this mean that we have a local min or a local max? Yeah. Well, let me give you an example. Let's look at y equals x cubed. At zero, the, hor the tangent is horizontal. But, all right, you know, of course we can check that, right? Take the derivative. This is f of x. What's f prime? Mm -hmm. x squared. Right? Evaluated at zero, of course you get zero. Okay? So it has a horizontal tangent for sure. Is it a local max or min? No, right? Since if you go to the left, it goes down. If you go to the right, it goes up. Right? 
Right? So it's not the highest or the lowest of the points in its neighborhood. Okay, it's kind of a middling student like I was. Okay, so this doesn't guarantee you all right, that you have a local max or a local min. Okay. What will guarantee it, though? Well, let's first ask an easier question. Right? How do I know if my curve is going up? If I have a curve it's going up, how can I test that? Okay, the numbers are increasing. Okay, fine. What if I look at the, uh, oh, I don't know, say the slope of the tangent lines? Okay. They're positive, right? If I draw a tangent line here, what's the, what's the derivative as far as positive or negative? It's positive. Okay, what if it was going down? What's the derivative? Negative. Negative. Okay. So the first derivative will tell you whether or not your function is increasing or decreasing at that point. Right? Just by, is it positive or negative? Right? If you have a positive slope, your function is going up. If you have a negative slope, it's going down. And what if the slope is zero? Then you have a horizontal tangent, right? It's not going up or down, right? And x cubed, I mean, for x cubed, it's zero, right? At zero, it's neither going up nor down. No. Okay, so this is called the increasing decreasing test. Okay. So if f prime of c is greater than zero, then f is increasing. And if f prime of c is less than zero, then f is decreasing. Okay, and we have to add some hypotheses on this. We, sh we should assume, of course, that our function is continuous and interval, that it's differentiable around there. But Okay, up to these little hypotheses. This is what the increasing decreasing test says. Okay, fine. But what we really wanted to know is, how can I tell if when I have a horizontal tangent, it's actually a local max or a local Well, let's look at this local max. What are the derivatives on the left side? They're increasing, right? The, the derivatives are positive. The function is increasing. And what about on the other side? Oops, that's not very good drawing. Going down. So I was going up, I hit a local max, and I turned around and went down. The tangent lines go up. The tangent lines go down. I have a local max. So we get the first derivative test. It says if f prime goes from positive to negative, then we get a local max. Now what do you think happens if f prime goes from negative to positive? You get a local min, right? Why? Well, local negative to positive means it looks like this. All right, it goes negative and then positive. Right? So you must have a min. Explaining how these functions are working. And what happens with x cubed? Well, here, the derivative, so around 0 on the left, is positive. And on the right, they're also positive. So it's going positive to positive, right? It's positive, 0, positive. So you don't get a local min or a local max. Anybody know what the name for this kind of point is? It is a critical point, but. There's a more specific point, right, where it, you get 
a zero, a horizontal tangent, but it's not changing. Yeah, it might be an inflection point. Okay, but we'll actually define that precisely. Because there's more that needs to be said before we can actually say that. Okay. Let me give you another example which causes problems. So we already said knowing the derivative is zero does not tell you that you have a local max or min. It suggests that you might, but it doesn't tell you. Because you might have x cubed. So you know whether you have a local max or min. Right? If you knew you had a zero derivative, you have to use the first derivative test. But here's another problem. Remember our good old friend, the absolute value? Right? Why is the absolute value interesting in this class? It's not differentiable at zero, but it is continuous at zero. Very good. It looks Something like that. Okay, now, let's forget about calculus for a moment. Does this function have a local minimum? Or absolute minimum? Forget about calculus. You don't know anything about calculus, right? So you're not thinking, what's well, not differentiable. So does this function have a minimum? Where? It's zero, right? You go down here, that's certainly the smallest this function can get. Okay, it's an absolute minimum, right? And if you do a neighborhood around it, okay, everything to the left or to the right is bigger than it. So it's also a local minimum. Right? So this is a local and absolute minimum. Okay. But if I use the first derivative test, what's going to happen? All right, well, well, I mean, actually, we shouldn't really have a problem with the first derivative test, should we? Right? First derivative test is going to be just fine. But if I forget about the first derivative test and start here and say, okay, I'm looking for horizontal tangents first. Right? So I'm looking for places where the derivative is zero. Is the derivative of this function ever zero? Right? It's always minus one or one, and it's not defined at zero. Right? So this shows you that these are not the only places that you can get a local max or a local min. You can also get it if the derivative, well, if the derivative isn't defined at a point, it just might, you might just have a local min or a local max. You have to check. Okay, so that's going to give us our definition of critical numbers. So, so critical numbers, all right, which are the numbers that we're, we're really interested in because we want to know what a local max or a local min is, are going to be defined as follows. So let, I'm going to call it crit of f. Okay, these are going to be the critical numbers of f. It's a set. Okay, remember, a set just has numbers in it. So crit of f is going to equal the set of all points in the domain. Okay, so we, I only care about points where the function is actually defined. Okay, if the function isn't defined, that doesn't count. Okay. So I either want a point where the derivative is zero, or the derivative does not exist. Okay. So for example, okay, by the way, these are called the critical numbers of the function, right? The critical numbers of f. So what would be the critical numbers of the absolute value of x? Well, you look for all points in the domain. Well, the domain is all real numbers, so that's no restriction. And I'm looking for all points in the domain such that, remember this bar means such that, okay, f prime is 0. Well, the derivative is never 0 in the absolute value. So that doesn't give you anything. Or the derivative doesn't exist, and we know, of course, that at zero, the derivative does not exist. So there's only one critical number. So even if you didn't know what this graph looked like, you could say, well, I know that the derivative doesn't exist at zero. And so I know that this is the only possibility 
for a local min or a local max. And then you could use the first derivative test to check it. You just look, okay, what's the derivative on the left side? Well, they're negative. What's the derivative on the right side? Well, they're positive. It goes from negative to positive, therefore it's a local minimum. Right? Negative, positive, minimum. Okay? If it was positive and negative, be a maximum. Um, well, what if you're saying that there's no value at zero? In the derivative. There's a hole in the derivative. Oh, not the function. Right? Okay. So if I wanted to graph the derivative of this function, right? That's not a bad exercise. Let's graph the derivative. Well, what's the derivative of this function? Well, remember, right, this is defined as x. If x is greater than or equal to zero, and it's negative x. Right? If x is less than zero. So we know that zero, you're not going to have a derivative. Okay, so we can throw that out. If it's bigger than zero, there's no problem, right? You just take the derivative of x, which is one. So I'll come up here to one, and I'll put a little hole at zero, and there's my derivative. One. And on the left side, okay. the derivative of minus x is minus one, right? So I come down here to minus one, I fill a little hole, and okay, so that's the graph of the derivative. Okay, so it's negative and then positive. So this tells you you had a local min. Right, and you do get a hole at zero in the derivative. But you don't have a hole in the graph of the function. That is defined at zero. It's zero. Okay, so these are the critical numbers. Let me do a quick example, another quick example. Right. Let's say I have uh, f of x equals the square root of x plus 3. Right. So what are the critical numbers of f? Well, first, of course, right, we need to say, OK, all the things which are in the domain of f. OK? So, I can't stick anything in here which is going to break the function, right? If I put in a minus 3, I'm going to get 0. Is that OK? Yeah. yeah, of course, squared is 0 is 0. That's no problem. But if I put something smaller than minus 3, then I'm going to get a negative under the radical, and that's definitely no good. Right. OK, fine. So I at least have to be minus 3 or above. But then I need to look at the derivative. So what's the derivative? Well, if I write this instead of x plus 3 square rooted, I can write it to x plus 3 is 1 half. And then what rule can I use? Power rule along with the chain rule. And it's going to give me 1 half x plus 3 to the minus 1 half. Right? And this negative exponent means I'm going to have to do 1 over. Right? So this really looks like 1 over 2 square root of x plus 3. Okay, now, where is this function zero? It's never zero, right? You have a fraction, it's only zero if the numerator is zero, and the numerator is always one. Okay? So we don't have to worry about the first part of the definition, which says f prime of c is zero. We only have to worry about the f prime of c does not exist. Okay? Where will the derivative not exist? Right. Now, if we, okay, of course, if you put in something smaller than negative 3. Then we, we couldn't do that anyway, right? It wasn't in the domain of f even. But if you put in minus 3, that was okay for f, but now you get a 0 in the denominator of a fraction, and that's no good. Right? So the critical value of f, there's just one of them, right? it's minus 3. Right? So now all you would have to do is, okay, does it make sense to even check what, what's going on right, with the derivatives, right? Well, what does the square root of x look like? It starts at 0, and then it goes Okay, does it make sense, do you think, to call 0 a local minimum? I mean, it's not so nice, right? I mean, it's certainly the, it's an absolute minimum, right? But local, somehow we, we talked about neighborhoods, right? You should be able to have a neighborhood around it. And there's no 
neighborhood on one side of it. There's just a neighborhood on the other side. So it's not so nice to call it a local minimum, right? So it's really more of an absolute. But it, to a certain extent, it's a definitional question. How are we going to define local? Are we going to assume that it has to be defined on both sides of it? Okay. So we'll get into that issue with the appropriate. Okay, so these critical numbers will be of critical importance in determining where the local max and mins of our functions are. Okay, the next thing is going to be concavity, and, and this comes back to a question we had earlier on about the graph of, I think, one of the inverse trig functions. Now, let's say I have a point on my graph, and I have another point on my graph. And I know that the graph has to go, it has to increase from this point to this point, never turns around, there's no ends or anything. How many different ways can it get from point A to point B? Three different ways, Lake says. There's just three different ways. Well, certainly there's more than three. I mean, okay, I could go this way, this way, this way, this way. Lots of different ways. But length is, for, is correct up to equivalence relation. <laughs> Whatever the heck I mean by that. Here's one easy way. Just draw a straight line between them. Okay? That's a very easy way. It's the shortest distance between the two points. But here's another way I can do it. And of course, I could change the arc here, right? I can do it just a little bit of arc, I can do a lot of arc. Right? As, long as, uh, as long as I never go up above it, right? Because I said it doesn't, it doesn't ever have a local max or min in between. And then I can also go below this line, like that. And of course I can really stretch it out, or I can do it really thin. Okay, but as long as you say, okay, fine, I have certainly the shortest distance, and then there's curves which go above that line, and the curves which go below, below that line, right? then there's really three types of ways of getting there. Right? How can we use calculus to look at these three different situations and differentiate them? And by differentiate, I don't mean actually find the derivative. Now I really mean tell the difference between them. It's a problem. So what we're going to do is give names to these situations, right? And particularly these top and bottom situations. So such a curve, right, which if you drew the, the straight line between them, this curve goes beneath it, right? We're going to call this concave up. And if you draw the straight line, and then you draw a curve which goes above that straight line, we're going to call that concave down. Right. In some books, this is called concave, and this is called, anybody know? Convex. Okay, so this is also sometimes called convex. Right. And the way I first learned it was actually concave and convex, and the way you remember concave is this one is because it looks like a cave. So it's concave. Or this is an upside down cave, which is how I remember now. It's a cave upside down. Okay. So the question will be how do you test for concavity? Okay, and that's where we're going to get the concavity test. Okay. Okay, fine. What is the concavity test? So again, we have to think what's going on. Okay, we're going to get a little intuition going here. All right, in all of these cases, what's the derivative? The, der the derivative is positive, right? The function is increasing. By the ID test, we know that the derivative is positive, right? Okay, so the derivative on all of these is positive. So the first derivative isn't helping us. Okay, because it doesn't differentiate between these. All right. Okay. 
But what is going on here? Well, the derivative was telling you the rate of change of the function. Okay, so if it's increasing, that the rate of change is going to be positive. Okay? But what we really care about in this case is the rate of change of the derivative. Right? We want to know is the derivative going is the, the rate of change of the derivative positive or is the rate of change of the derivative negative? Right? Why? Well, what would happen if the rate of change of the derivative was positive? Well, that would mean that not only, okay, so we know the derivative is already positive, right? So it's going up. But if the rate of change of the derivative is positive, that means that it's going up faster. Okay, so in terms of velocity, right? Velocity was the first derivative, right? What was the second derivative? Acceleration. It was acceleration, right? So that meant acceleration being positive means it's, that the particle is going faster, right? So the, the, the velocity is getting bigger. Okay? And that's what's happening, for instance, in this case. Okay? Right? The rate of change of the derivative is positive here. It's going faster. And this one is, well, of course it's, it's going up, right? And we know that the derivative, therefore, is positive. But it's somehow slowing down as it's going up. Okay? It's, it, it's not going up as fast. Right? If this thing kept going, what would happen, right? It would just kind of, you would think it would just kind of tail off. Whereas this one, if it kept going, right? So the concavity test right, is going to say, if the second derivative, so remember this meant take two derivatives, okay, if the second derivative is greater than zero, and I'm leaving off hypotheses as usual, then the curve is concave up. Okay, so when the second derivative is positive, the curve is concave up. And if the second derivative is negative, so if the rate of change of the first derivative is negative, right? So if it's not going up by as much, then the curve is concave down. Okay. So this is very exciting. I can tell in your faces. You're really excited, right? What this is saying is, if we wanted now to solve that problem about whether that inverse trig function, right, when it went from point A to point B, right, went like this or went like this, we just have to check the second derivative and look at its values. Okay. All right. Now. What happens when the concavity changes? Okay, let's say I'm going up. Now, is my graph concave up or concave down? Okay. Concave down, right? So it looks like a cave. Okay. Which means, what about my second derivative? It's negative, right? If you have a negative second derivative, then the curve is concave down. So this over here, concave down, this corresponded to right, the second derivative being negative. And this over here corresponded to the second derivative being positive. OK. So now we go over here. So I have this nice concave down. So my second derivative is positive. And then it turns around. Okay. Now, what's my graph over here? Is it concave up or concave down? Concave up. It's like a little bowl, concave up. Okay. Now, at some point, so if this is negative second derivative, and it's concave up here, so the second derivative is positive. Right. So let's just put it here, right? What's the, the second derivative? Well, 
here to here it's negative. And on this side it's positive. <coughs> what must have happened at this point? Zero. Must be zero, right? What is it? How, how do I know that? Well, what theorem is it that tells me if I have a function which is negative and then becomes positive and it's continuous, it must be zero in the middle? Very good. Very good. The intermediate value here. Of course, I'm assuming, right, that it's defined and it's continuous at this point, right? But it must be zero. Right. But now, this was exactly what our x cubed was looking like. Okay. You had it going up, then it flattened out, right? You got a horizontal tangent in the graph, okay? and then it became positive. Okay, so but the whole function was increasing. Okay. But we now can describe how it's increasing. On the left, it's increasing, but in kind of this slowed down way, right? Where the concavity is down. And then on the other side, it goes up real fast, right? And that's the concave up. Okay, and that's where the second derivative was positive. And then right here, you get a horizontal tangent, but you don't change whether it's increasing or decreasing. Okay, but the, so which, right, but the second derivative was zero. Okay, so this is, this is the key here, right? Is even though it's not changing whether it's increasing, it's changing how it's increasing. Right? The rate of change of, how, of, of its increasingness is changing. And this is what we want to call a point of inflection, right? where the concavity is changing, either from negative to positive, from positive to negative. So this is a point of inflection. Okay. Let's look at another picture. I'm decreasing, and now I'm increasing. So here's a case where, well, let's see. It's a decreasing function, so we know that the derivative is negative, right? Or to put it another way, it is negative tangent lines, that is the slope of those tangent lines are negative, and so we know the function is decreasing. Okay. We also can say something about the second derivative. What's the second derivative here? Concave up. It's concave up, so the second derivative is positive. The first derivative is negative, but the second derivative is positive. Okay. This is show you that they're not correlated. Just because the first derivative might be positive doesn't mean the second derivative is positive. Just because the first derivative is negative doesn't mean the second derivative is negative. Okay? These are independent things, almost. Okay? So here we know that it's a decreasing function, because the first derivative is negative, but it's a concave up function, so the der second derivative is positive. Okay? Now we get to the bottom. Okay? We have a horizontal tangent, so we know it here, right? The derivative is zero at that point. Okay. Now, what's happening to concavity around here? Well, let's see. It was concave up, and then it became concave down. Right. So this is also a point of inflection. Right. And on the other side, right here again, we have the reverse, right? So here. Uh, of course, we know okay, it's concave up, concave down. We also know the second derivative is zero, right? So it was also a point of inflection, right? Because the concavity is changing. Okay, and on the other side, right? So over here, let's see, f prime is negative, right? But f double prime is positive, and over here, f prime is positive because it's going up, but f double prime is negative. about this point? It's a minimum. So this is a, a local minimum. Okay, so we have a lot we can say now about this point. And 
Here's the thing. I've drawn a graph and then we've taken the information. Okay? But what we want to do is take the information and draw a graph. Okay? So let's take this information and see how we can get the graph out. Okay, so I have some information. I know I'm starting with a function. And forget the graph, right? We'll erase the graph. Okay, so we erase the graph. Now, all I have is I know I have a function which was decreasing, but it's decreasing in such a way that the concavity is positive. So that means, say it starts it's got to go down, okay? It's not going to go down straight, and it's not going to go down like this. It's got to go down like this, okay? okay? Then at some point, we know that the derivative is zero. So we get a horizontal tangent. And we also know that the second derivative is zero, which means the concavity is going to change. Right? Or at least it could change. Okay? It could go back up to positive. Okay? But we should look for a change. And sure enough, it does change goes to negative. And the derivative goes to positive. So we're getting a minimum. It's going to turn around and it has to be concave down. So we have just used the information right, to graph what we had up here already. Now, of course, you know, we're not saying how severely these are sloped, right? We don't know it exactly, but we have a very good idea what the curves look like. And you can draw conclusions from that. Okay, so this is very nice. Okay, so that's this is what we're we're trying to get at. Uh, let me give you one last bit. Let's take a very easy curve that we we know. Okay, so this is a parabola. Maybe this is minus x squared. Does it have an absolute maximum? Clearly, right? Does it have an absolute minimum? No. Does it have a local minimum? No, not even. Does it have a local maximum? Sure, right? It's an absolute maximum. It's also a local maximum. Okay. Now, the way that we were able to test this, bless you, being a local maximum, we said, okay, well, let's look at the tangent line on either side. Okay, it goes from positive to negative, therefore, it's a maximum. Okay, bless you. Let's say we wanted to just look at the point itself, at the derivative. Okay, we know that the derivative is zero at this point. So that's all good then. Okay? We're in good shape. The first derivative is zero, so it's possibly a local max. Now, what's happening to the second derivatives around this point? Okay? So let's draw a little chart here. Okay? So at this point, we know that the first derivative is, is zero. And what about the second derivative? Well, what's the second derivative on this side? Concave down, so what is the second derivative? It's negative. And what is it on this side? It's negative. Now what's happening in the second derivative at this point? Not as easy to see, is it? You immediately want to think, oh, well, it's zero, right? Because you're thinking the first derivative. But if you think about it, what's happening? What's happening to the, the change in the function at this point? I mean, the change in the derivative. Well, let's just write down an example and see. Say, I said that this function could be negative x squared. So the derivative is going to be what? Negative 2x. And so what's the second derivative going to be? 
negative 2. It's actually always negative 2. Not just always negative, but it means negative 2. Okay, that's nice, but it's always negative. So this means actually it's negative at this point. And that should make a little bit of sense because what's happening to the derivative? Okay, the derivative here, right, are these, these slopes, right? And as you go up, the slopes are getting less. They're getting less, they're getting less, they're getting less. Okay? And at this point it's zero, but it's still in the process of getting less. Getting less, getting less, getting less, right? At every point, the derivative goes down by, my, by 2. That's why the derivative is minus 2x, right? It goes down by 2. So, what's amazing here is by just looking at the second derivative at this point, we can figure out what's happening to the first derivative, right? And if we know that it's getting less, then that means that it had to have been going up and then going down, which means you have a local max. And so you get the second derivative test, which I'll write as f double prime test. And again, I'll leave out all the hypotheses. Roughly, is saying that if f double prime at your point is less than zero. Okay, so it's negative. Then, and of course we're assuming this is already a, 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 already a, so we have a prime of c of zero. Okay, so we're already in the case where we have a horizontal tangent. Okay, then f has a local max. At c. Okay, so this, I see. If you have something which is concave down all the way, okay, right, you go to this point, then you have a local max. And that makes sense, right? A cave will have a max point. Right? And if it was concave up, what do you think it'll have? A midpoint, right? So if the second derivative is positive, then f has a local min. Okay, so this is very nice, because instead of having to use the first derivative test and testing points on either side, you can just take the second derivative and test it at this point. Now, what happens if the second derivative is zero? It's, right, well, yeah, you're not quite sure, right? If it's switched from positive to negative, then you have a point of inflection, right? But, uh, you know, you could probably cook up a really nice example where you where you're just going to have neither, right? For instance, we had our x cubed. We had x cubed. Okay, so this is f of x equals x cubed. The derivative is 3x squared. The second derivative is 6x. At 0, the second derivative is 0. So we don't know whether it's a local max or min, and of course, in this case, it isn't a local max or min. So the derivative, if it ends up being zero, you don't learn anything new. Okay. Okay, so the last thing I say in the last couple of minutes is the last thing on our list, which was optimization. Okay. So how does this all relate to optimization? What do I mean by optimization? Well, let's say for instance, you're running a business, right, and you're selling a product. Realistically, your goal is to maximize your profits. Yeah? Okay, fine. So you have some very basic things. You know what price you can sell things for, right? And let's say you know that if you sell at a given price, how many you're going to be able to sell. You've had your statistic statisticians go out and figure this out. And you figure out where your the maximizing of your profits is going to be. And of course, it's not necessarily going to be where we maximize revenue, right? Which is just the price times the quantity. Okay, you also have to factor in how much it costs you to make these things. Okay, fine, so but you, you put together some equation, right? some function, which is going to say, okay, if I set my price at this level, this will be what my profits are. How do I know if I'm trying to maximize profits what to do? Well, if I can graph this function, I just look on the picture, right? And say, okay, there's where the max is. That's max of my profits. Or you forget about graphing it and you just say, fine. I'm looking for maxes and mins. Okay. 
So I should just take first derivatives and second derivatives, right? And look for where my local and max mins are. Just them equal to zero. Right? I can use all these very basic intuitive tools to answer those questions. Right? Let's say you're a farmer and you want to enclose right, your chicken in some area and you want it to be as big of an area as possible, but you only have a certain amount of fencing to use. Okay, again, you can figure out, okay, if I design it in different shapes, okay, I can write a function which is going to tell me the area I'm covering based on right, how I configure things. Right? Just a simple rectangle based on, say, the length and the width, right? What's going to be the area? And you look again for the max and the mins of your functions just using these simple tools. Okay? So, this is how we're going to apply calculus in a lot of different situations is by looking and saying, these are really optimization problems. And of course, these linear approximations we did early on, these are going to be you know, different. This is how you know, we're going to uh, you know, approximate some complicated system right, by something that we understand and we lines. Okay. That's what we're going to do for the next five, six. Thank you very much.